From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's coming up. Out of the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Caitlin McCulloch is featured on this week's cattle market segment. Caitlin will go over the numbers from that USDA cattle inventory report, which indicated that the nation's cow herd continues to contract. Also today, K-State's Greg Hanselcheck with new data on scours disease in newborn beef calves. This from the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at K-State. It shows which pathogens are the leading causes of scours relating to prevention and treatment approaches. And further ahead, Jeff Wickman with this week's 4-H segment. He'll talk with K-State's Wade Weber about 4-H scholarship opportunities. All that and more right here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part. Because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. This is the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. We appreciate you being along with us. We have a load of topics to pick up on in regard to the cattle market. And in fact, some good vibes in that market on the heels of a USDA biannual cattle inventory report last Friday. Along with us from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, its director, Caitlin McCulloch. She's lending her thoughts to the markets this week. It appears, Caitlin, as we look at the cash-fed cattle scene last week, it is a stronger tone to that market. Yeah, so on Friday, the five-year ended the week at about 113 to 114 for delivered live cattle, and we were up to 111 on live FOB. So that's up a couple bucks from what we averaged to the prior week. Um, On the futures board, live cattle took a little bit of a hit on Friday, but still trending higher. And the cattle inventory report looks like it's going to support those prices uh, from here on out. Feeder cattle futures on Friday were down uh, just slightly, down about two bucks is what they looked like they ended. But on the cash side, one thing I would point out is although they were they look like they were down this this last week, feeder cattle prices have remained relatively firm despite the the vast volatility that we're seeing in the grain markets. You're getting at this that it's somewhat impressive to see these markets hold up in the face of five plus dollar corn, five and a half dollars in in some bids. That has something to say about the resiliency of the cattle market currently, doesn't it? It certainly does. So part of that could be still strong feedlot demand, because if you look at what our break even say, um, we're still projecting they can probably make money in the summer quarter, which is a bit unusual from a seasonal perspective, but also the cattle inventory, and I know we're going to talk more about it in a minute, has shown that the calf crop was revised down in 2019, and it's showing up quite a bit smaller here in in 2020 as well. And one more fundamental before we get to that report in full. On the demand side, boxed beef back on the rise. The run-up in boxed beef has been somewhat surprising over the last couple weeks. And we gained another 5% last week um, on choice select beef or about $11.19 per 100 wheat. Now, ribbon loin primals have really done well. And those have been the largest gains week over week for the last couple weeks. So in the most recent week, loins were up $24.20 from the week before. That's an average on the average weekly basis. And the rib primal was up $15.39. Now, seasonally, we would expect box beef to decline in the first quarter, but perhaps this pattern might be a little bit familiar to last year when prices were elevated for a couple of weeks in early February. And in 2020, so again, this is before the pandemic hit, we saw a tiny bump there in the cutout and then it moved seasonally lower. And I would expect these cutout values to weaken too, unless there's really a lot of demand support for it. Select box beef values have been really strong as well. Um, they were up $10.59 on the week um, last week over the week before, and loin values for this grade jumped almost $20 a hundredweight as well, and rib values climbed about 13 this in this latest week. But this is three consecutive weeks across both head out grades that have shown really strong week-over-week growth. So we started out three weeks ago up about 2%, 
the last two weeks have been in that four to six percent range week over week. So very strong right now, especially given where we are in the year. Let's hope that this trend has staying power. As we emerge eventually from this pandemic, that would be a great footing for the market. Now to that cattle inventory report. You cited calf numbers a second ago here. What's enthusing about this is it seems to affirm that we're not seeing a, an expanding herd. And in fact, we see something of a contraction in beef cow numbers. So the cattle inventory report showed that total cow and calves were down about three-tenths of a percent. And that report came out Friday. It's released by USDA's uh, National Agricultural Statistics Service. And we get once a year a January 1 number, and then we also get a July 1 number. And so this is our really our signpost for what to expect the next year in terms of the cattle cycle, um, where the direction of the cow herd's going. And this seemed to affirm that we're still in a contractionary phase, as you mentioned. Now, the beef herd came in about six tenths of a percent lower, and the calf crop was revised from where the July number was, and as well as last year's 2019's number. So the 2020 calf crop was listed down about 1.3%, and the 2019 calf crop was revised down to about 2% from 2018. That's about a half a million head we lost in 2019. There are other some noteworthy changes or maybe lack thereof of changes. So there were zero beef replacement number was very close to a year ago. And most of the analysts ahead of the report thought that number for sure was going to contract. The other thing is that there was lower dairy heifer replacements. Now, given where the dairy herd number has been over the last couple months, most analysts expected that number to, to increase substantially. And it was only up about six tenths of a percent. Now, some of that is because both categories were revised in 2020 up slightly. So it's some of that is playing into, into account. The other thing I wanted to flag for you is that the cattle grazing on small, small grains, that's a three-state survey, um, showed a huge rebound from 2020's small number. And that's at 1.7 million head. That's a 7.5% jump from last year. So you do have quite a bit more cattle there out in the country that still need to come on feed. And when that timing is, which is going to probably matter quite a bit to what we see in the Fed in terms of how Fed cattle prices react throughout the year. Now, the reduction in the calf crop last year is setting up for tighter supplies in 2021, and that should continue to support those feeder cattle prices as we talked about. And the lower number in 2021 confirms that we're going to see beef supplies for the next couple of years probably be smaller than the prior year. So we have both lower beef cow herd inventory and a lower calf crop. And so that's going to really set us up for the next two to three years to see beef production move lower in consecutive years. All in all, plenty of positives out of the USDA report. One more thing we'd like to get to in our time today, Caitlin, and this is actually drawn from an article you have on your LMIC.info website. Looking at the latest hay stocks report as of December and giving an idea of hay supplies out there, as usual, depends on where you're located as to how intense those supply shortages might be or surpluses for that matter. What does that report tell us in general? So we get the hay stock number twice a year, once at December 1 and once for as of May 1st. And May 1st is the start of the new hay marketing year. But the December 1 number is giving you an idea of what you have during the winter quarters. Now, in 2020, we saw widespread drought in the West, and that has elevated prices, particularly in that area of the country, to quite a bit above where the national average is. So you have a pretty big dichotomy between what's happening east to west. The number itself was only down half a percent or so uh, nationally. But we had states like Nevada that were down 57% from the prior year, New Mexico down 36%, Colorado down 15%. And so you have situations where hay is, hay is not widely available, and if it is, it's very expensive. What happened in other hay production was that we had an increase in acres, but that wasn't enough to offset the yield. So we ended up down about three-tenths of a percent in other hay production nationally, but again, we saw large declines in Western states. Now, in alfalfa, you saw both a decline in acres and in 
and in yield. And that led to a production number that was down more than 3% over the prior year. From an outlook perspective, it is going to be really tough to see alfalfa price come down below a year ago. Nationally, the new seedings report that tells us how many new alfalfa acres gets planted was the lowest in 47 years uh, wow. in 2020. So LMIC has alfalfa prices moving above a year ago. Now, it could be that you have more of a muted national price and that some individual states experience extremely high prices, but nationally, we're expecting a pretty small increase. So really, and you're hinting at this, Caitlin, very much a telltale production year for hay ahead. If drought ensues and we're down on productivity once again, this high hay market will be around for quite some time. That's what it feels like to me. And the only other comment I would make is that for many states, hay is a domestic crop, but for the West, they they also contend with the export market and history doesn't always repeat itself. But when we've had hay prices, high hay prices in the past, that hasn't made the export market shy away. We've seen tremendous growth from China and Saudi Arabia during the times when we had U.S. prices over $190 a ton for alfalfa. And so that's another aspect of this is that you know, domestic producers will, will not just be competing with other domestic producers, that they might also have to contend with export demand, which is a double-edged sword if you're talking about the livestock producer. But for a hay grower, that a lot of times helps support those prices in years where maybe it would have come down more. You might want to, producers, have a look at the write-up on this topic that's posted on the LMIC.info website. Well, Caitlin, we always appreciate your insight on all of this, and we will catch up with you again in a few weeks. Many thanks. Thank you, Eric. She's with the Livestock Marketing Information Center out in Denver. Again, it's a project co-sponsored by several land-grant universities, including Kansas State University. The director of the center, Caitlin McCulloch, on the cattle markets. Here on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit KansasRadonProgram.org for more information. Test, fix, save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. We're back now on Agriculture Today and allowing a few moments for thoughts for you cow-calf producers as the spring calving season will commence for a goodly number of you here in the coming weeks. We've welcomed back by from the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at K-State, the director of the Production Animal Field Investigations Unit out of that laboratory, Greg Hanselcheck. And Greg, the primary thing we'll focus on is uh, regular and annual occurrence for producers, Scour's disease. And you have some data that you've collected from this past year on the prevalence of that condition in beef calves. Yep, that's exactly right. And so we do this every year. We look through all the submissions that have come through our laboratory, and we've got a, we actually have a couple tests that look for all the pathogens that are associated with scours. And so we just finished summarizing our data from last year. That includes over 2,000 samples that we looked at. If you would then go over what the numbers are suggesting about the, the frequency of scours disease in beef calves here in Kansas. Okay, great. And our test looks for all the pathogens, so we basically it's going to look for the two major viruses, rota and coronavirus. Uh, there's one protozoa, primary crypto, and then two of the bacteria, salmonella and E. coli. And looking at over 2,000 samples, about 46% of all those samples were positive. Of those that were positive were positive for either rota or crypto. And so those are the two primary pathogens that we're finding in in scouring calf samples. Some of the samples are feces. Some of them are actual tissue from from calves that have become deceased. Uh, Corona, salmonella, E. coli at a lesser percentage. 
35% of all the samples that we looked at actually had a combination of pathogens. So, and, and the combinations were all over from two pathogens to three to even four, all four together. The thing that was more striking this year compared to previous years was if we looked at the two organisms that actually we call zoonotic, which means a human can actually become infected and, and go through basically a, uh, an intestinal issue, 46% of the samples had either or crypto or salmonella. Those are our two zoonotic organisms. And so we really want to recommend to producers that they're mindful of the, the fact that they can pick up some of these scouring organisms when they're handling these calves. Let's stay with that latter point for just a second here. If those are present and one is working with scouring calves, one can contract either or both of those pathogens and uh, realize health issues on their own. So you want folks to think in a, a protective mode here. Absolutely. And, it, and it's a it's a oral thing. I mean, you handle scour calves, we get just a, a little bit of the bacteria and we ingest it uh, or the protozoa. It can be devastating. People can end up in the hospital on IV fluids and, and on and on. So we highly recommend that producers always wear gloves when they're when they're handling these scouring calves. Uh, be mindful of the fact that uh, sometimes they're going to get the bacteria or protozoa or viruses on their clothing. And so we, we highly recommend they don't take their clothing in the house if they've got young kids or, or elderly uh, inhabitants of the house. Probably should keep kids away from any of those scouring calves when we're treating them or moving them or, or whatever. We just need to concentrate more and more on sanitation and uh, uh, making sure that we're not going to become infected with those organisms. Duly noted on that. These pathogens then can commonly be found on the majority of operations, you say? Absolutely. All of these organisms, except for maybe salmonella, are on every single cow-calf operation. There's been a lot of testing research showing, so they're there. It's just a matter of keeping the the numbers down to where they're not going to cause disease in the calves. Because just because they're there doesn't mean they're going to cause disease. There's plenty of evidence then as to why prevention and treatment protocols are so important. So you look at those numbers, Greg, what do they suggest along those lines? Well, the best the best prevention is we beat people up about colostrum protection. I won't go into that, but having our cows on a proper uh, nutritional plan so that they're producing good quality colostrum, the calf gets up and nursing it, that's a key part. The other key part is that the bigger, the larger the area that these calves are born in, the less number of pathogens they're going to be exposed to. And that is that is really key is to reduce or minimize the amount of adult and older calf manure that these young calves are exposed to just immediately after birth, certainly within the first seven to ten days of life. Sanitation then is is imperative here and you note especially for those who are dry lotting their cow calf herds at calving, and that's been a practice that's been picked up more and more. Especially important, you've got to stay on top of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, like you said, more and more operations in the Midwest are going to a, a dry lot situation. Uh, if we have very many animals in that lot, and our calving season is long for any length at all, then that that manure, those pathogens are going to continue to build up in time and. It's probably going to be necessary to periodically uh, get in there and and remove as much of that manure that's on the ground as possible. The other thing they can do is to help is to also, uh, after they do that, is actually put bedding down for those calves so that there's a there's a barrier between where the organisms are and the calf, and then that'll help reduce the amount of exposure that those baby calves have. And there's one more angle on that, and that is one can rotate the herd through calving areas, and we've talked about those systems before, but that has helped with scours suppression. Absolutely. They can do the Sandhills calving system where we just continually move uh, pregnant animals to clean ground and calve them. A simpler method is just we send out the pairs as fast as we can, and we move those out of the out of the calving area. I mean, we have them up close to a facility because we're we're concerned about dystocias and we might have to intervene. Well, once they're born, we don't have to worry about that. So we can take those pairs and send them away from the working facility out on clean ground, which also keeps the ground where we're still calving uh, from becoming more contaminated than necessary. 
Well, the accent's always on prevention, but let's spend a moment or two on treatment if scours sets in. And you have some points you you try to drum home with producers to perhaps manage those responses a little differently. Absolutely. And I I would say it's probably rare for a producer to go through a calving season and not have to treat a calf or two with scours. Uh, we want to keep that as a, at a minimum. But just some of the the things that are that are important about that is that the treatment for scours are not really antibiotics. Antibiotics have no effect against those pathogens except for maybe a couple of them. And calves, when they become scour calves and they die from scours, they're dying from dehydration. So the key is fluids with electrolytes. And we're talking about, if we catch them early, we're talking about oral fluids. So we're we're talking about having the ability to actually drench those calves with the fluids. And that is the key to help these calves recover. And they will recover on their own if we just can keep the dehydration from becoming too severe. And what you've found in interacting with producers, too many occasions those electrolytes are administered too lightly? Yes. These products, uh, 99.9%, are uh, made to mix with two quarts of, of warm water. So we never we never want to give more than two quarts at one time. But I don't know that there's any occasion where two quarts once a day is enough for a dehydrated calf. And an easy way to to think about how many quarts we need to give this calf throughout the day is if we just take the skin and over the neck of the calf and make a tent of it, pull it away from the muscle and then release it and count how many seconds it takes for it to become flat. And if it's two seconds, that calf is definitely dehydrated. The minimum that calf needs is two quarts twice a day. If it takes more than two seconds, a two to three second for it to go flat, then we need two quarts at least three times a day. And the key is you can go as many times a day at two quarts at a time as you want. That's not going to hurt the calf. If you if you overdo the fluids, they're just going to urinate more is what's going to happen. And that that's actually a good way to determine whether you're giving enough fluids to your scouring calves when you're out there just observing. Notice if they're urinating or not. And if they're not, then that probably means you should add another another feeding today. The message there then, again, don't underdose. And you would encourage strongly that producers consult their veterinarian about product selection here too. Absolutely. There are lots and lots of electrolytes on the market. It's non-regulated. There's a lot of them that uh, researchers have looked at that are not beneficial to calves. In fact, some of them might even be detrimental to calves. And and so it's important that not only the volume of the electrolytes in the water, but also the quality. So, yeah, contact the local veterinarian and ask them, we want a really high-quality electrolyte solution for our scouring calves. Well, this condition is an annual challenge for our cow-calf producers out there. Managing past it, important. Preventing it, even more so. And hopefully, Greg, next year this time, your numbers, as they come into the laboratory, will be down. Due diligence will make that happen. Absolutely. I, You know, it would be nice, and I think producers would, would agree that if we could prevent scours, and it wouldn't be the thing that we, we wonder about when we go into calving season, we'd all feel a lot better about it calving cows. Thanks, as always, for coming over, Greg. He's Greg Hanselcheck from the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at Kansas State University. We'll be back with more after this break. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And next up, today's agricultural news headlines for you. In brief, these courtesy in part of DTN. 
And a quick glimpse here to the Kansas numbers from that USDA cattle inventory report, which was released on Friday. All cattle and calves in Kansas as of January the 1st, totaling 6.5 million head. That was up 2% from the previous January report. Beef cows at 1.48 million head, up 2% from last year. All heifers, 500 pounds and over, totaling just over 2 million head, up 4% from last year. And calves under 500 pounds, 600. 60,000, down 4% from last January. The 2020 calf crop totaling 1.43 million head. That was unchanged from 2019. Some of the Kansas numbers from the USDA's cattle inventory report. Incoming Senate Agriculture Committee Chairwoman Debbie Stabenow said last week that the confirmation hearing for Tom Vilsack, the nominee for Agriculture Secretary scheduled for tomorrow, may depend on Senate leaders reaching agreement on a resolution for organizing the Senate. In a call to reporters on her agenda for the Congress, Stabenow said that she hopes that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell will reach an agreement no later than today. Stabenow said that she and Senator John Boozman of Arkansas, the incoming ranking member, are assuming they'll have their committee members by tomorrow. But if they have not been announced, she and Boozman, she said, will have to figure out what to do, as other committees have when they have had and held their uh, confirmation hearings. Stabenow said the number of members in the committee has not been determined, but it will be half Democrats and half Republicans. The situation on the Agriculture Committee in arranging the confirmation hearing more complicated than for the other four committees. That's because the other committees have continued to be run by the Republican chairs from the previous Congress. Of course, as you know, Senator Pat Roberts of Kansas, who chaired agriculture, has retired, and there's been no interim chair. Stabenow said she does not expect Vilsack to face any contentious areas at that hearing, saying that he has strong bipartisan support. But she added that she also wants Vilsack to lay out his vision for the future. Stabenow noted that the committee also has to hold confirmation hearings on other Biden administration officials and said that at the top of the list is a USDA undersecretary for rural development working to expand the Internet, which she says is important to rural hospitals, schools and other rural entities. Now, the man that would be the head of the USDA says he supports more investment in scientific research. More on that from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. Ag Secretary-designate Tom Vilsack has stressed the importance of public investment in scientific research. Whether it's through a land-grant university or whether it's through the United States Department of Agriculture and its science-based activities or through any other governmental entity. He was speaking to a coalition of land-grant universities that focuses on infectious diseases in animals. We've relied more and more on the private sector to do a lot of this work. And the problem, of course, with that is that there's a profit motive, understandably, that drives the private sector which oftentimes makes access to whatever the research and development creates more expensive and more exclusive, if you will, than it needs to be. Which he adds highlights the need for government investment. And important to stand up the new opportunity, the new research opportunity that was created by the 2018 Farm Bill at USDA. Not yet stood up. I think it's something that needs obviously attention. And I would imagine and suspect that in the next couple of years, we're going to see more activity in that space. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. On the agricultural calendar for this month, the Center for Rural Enterprise Engagement will be hosting the 5th Annual Insight Summit Conference. It is set for February the 24th through the 26th. It'll be completely virtual. This summit will focus on the changes to social media strategies needed to market effectively in the current online environment of 2021. It'll take a look at trends in social media, building one's business narrative, establishing a new media base. Baseline, e-newsletters, Instagram, e-commerce, and all of it. K-State Research and Extension Nursery Crops Specialist Cheryl Boyer is one of the co-organizers. My colleagues and I created a center for, it's called the Center for Rural Enterprise Engagement. And our purpose is all about helping small ag businesses figure out how to navigate the complex world of online marketing navigating these online tools that help people find you and use the resources that you have created or become customers of your business. And it's constantly changing. But one of the resources that we have created is a conference called the CRE Insight Summit. So we really like to focus on analytics and help you understand 
setting goals and moving forward and knowing if the efforts that you're putting in on online marketing are making a difference. So in the past, it's been an in-person conference. Last year, we had our very first hybrid version. We, we try to rotate it among the states of, our, of the three states of the center, which is Kansas, Minnesota, and Florida. So last year, it was in Minnesota, and we had a hybrid conference, and it worked really, really wonderfully. This year, we're going to go all online. I think most programs have headed that direction this year. And the good news is we have a ton of experience with it now. So it's going to be a great conference. We're really hoping that we can have a wide spectrum of folks involved in agricultural businesses or in rural communities that will join us as part of the conference and um, just learn what we have to offer. So we're busily working on the content right now. We're planning to have the workbook. We always print a workbook, but we're going to try to have it printed and mailed to everybody who is an early register person so that during the conference, you will have a physical workbook to look through. So yeah, it's going to be a a really hands-on event for you to really set some time aside to think about how to do your company or your organization marketing a little bit better. And the good news is now that it's all online, we're really, and we've had lots of experience with online programs across the country, we're really setting it up to be a national conference. So it does cover three days, but they're not full days. They're kind of midday. We will be hosting that very soon. And we encourage you to go get signed up. And we do have a scholarship application for those that have a need to to have a reduced fee to attend. K-State's Cheryl Boyer there, again, this Insight Summit online, set for February the 24th through the 26th, and you can find out more about it at www.ruralengagement.org. That's ruralengagement, all one word, dot O-R-G. And quickly reminding that those last two K-State Winter Ranch Management Seminars will be taking place later on this month, both on Tuesday, February the 16th, one in Beaumont at the Depot Community Center and the other in Council Grove at the Morris County Community Building. There's still time to register for those fine events. To do so, go to ksubeef.org to follow up on more details. We'll be back shortly. This is Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. Kansas 4-H youth interested in applying for 2021 Kansas 4-H scholarships can now apply online. Kansas 4-H state leader Wade Weber says the deadline to complete applications and submit recommendation letters or references is March 1st. Wade, we've been talking on past programs about record keeping, and one of the reasons for that is documentation and the fact that you have an opportunity to really look back on what you've been doing. Another opportunity is scholarships, and all of that information is needed when you're applying for scholarships. Absolutely. One of the things we pride ourselves in the 4-H program is learning by doing and being able to help young people articulate the things that they have been learning and who they've been learning with and how it's had an impact in their local community are really key components for their own educational and you know developmental journey, but it's also important when it comes to those life skills related to applying for a job, but in this context, uh, applying for scholarships. And tis the season for many uh, high school seniors and or folks who've just recently graduated high school as they think about next steps for their educational journey and their career preparedness journey, the opportunity to definitely scour the environment for resources, and uh, we're glad that in the 4-H program, we have tremendous support through many donors and recent and long-standing alumni who believe in the 4-H program and its mission and want to continue to encourage 4-H members uh, as they continue to grow and uh, look for ways to contribute to their community that they can recognize that the 4-H program provides opportunities for them to apply for scholarships that can help them with the tangible needs 
associated with that career preparedness at an educational institution of their choosing. Well, and I've noticed that you actually have a lot of scholarship opportunities, more than 75 opportunities to apply. Yeah, we're very excited about just the diverse range of uh, supporters who have either designated certain uh, locales or topical areas that they have an interest in as a donor. Maybe they've had a career in that field and they want to continue to encourage young people to apply for schooling and or job training in that field. Or if it's an opportunity just to believe in general in the 4-H program and how it's encouraging young people to refine those skills into a, a career applicable area, we're just really excited about the ways in which our partners from across the state of Kansas and even across the Midwest and country have donated to the Kansas 4-H Foundation in order to provide for scholarship opportunities for young people. At this juncture, uh, we do have 75. Uh, We're always looking for opportunities to continue to encourage more young people to have other scholarships that they could apply for. So if there's any folks who are listening out there who would like to contribute to the ongoing educational opportunities for young people through the 4-H program to consider uh, being a donor for the scholarship process, go ahead and contact Kansas 4-H Foundation and they'll help you set that up. And uh, it's because of their generosity. It really is a true example of paying it forward and uh, investing in the next generation so that they can continue to be those community leaders that we will look to as we tackle the challenges that tomorrow will bring. Is this typically a mix then of companies, professional businesses, and individuals as well that develop all of these scholarship opportunities? Yeah, most of the uh, scholarships that we have currently are related to individuals and individual families um, because of their experiences and what have you. There are a few that you know relate to specific topics, for instance, like uh, the Wheat Growers Association and other types of things like that that might be affiliated with a particular industry or topical area of, that's relevant in our community. But by and large, it really comes down to individual families, individual people, as well as uh, vested interests, you know, businesses in our community that want to invest in the future of the 4-H program by encouraging those young people who've been a beneficiary of the Kansas 4-H program to encourage application for scholarships to help them with those tangible needs that their education and, and or job training will help them in the future for. I would imagine that the process may be a little bit different depending on which scholarship you are applying for, but what are some of the basic information things that they might want to have on hand before they start this process? Absolutely. Well, one of the things that we've uh, definitely taken a look at this year and we're pleased to streamline our process to uh, similar to our parent uh, organization, Kansas State University, where there's kind of a universal application that a young person can be a part of and a recent alum can be a part of, basically have a couple supplemental documents that help them summarize, one, their official high school transcript. They'll need to have that ready to go and be available ultimately to be submitted. Also, a two-page resume of accomplishments and achievements. Again, trying to emphasize that importance of making sure that the things that you choose to put on your resume are impactful, that give an accurate picture of kind of your experience. But at the same token, uh, learn to use words that uh, are purposeful. So again, not just being a long, exhaustive list, but really prioritizing what are the things that really describe my 4-H experience and how it relates to the scholarship and what that donor is looking for when it comes to funding that scholarship. And then one of the additions that we're doing uh, this year, which is really relevant, is we're also inviting applicants this year to have a video presentation for about a maximum of four minutes in length uh, that will just describe how 4-H has impacted them. At the same token, talk a little bit about their resume and their experiences and basically learn to sell themselves in a, in a video format. So again, using professional address and posture of helping them uh, present themselves because we know that in this day and age, uh, obviously with With all the things that we're doing virtually, it's important to manage your presentation as best as you can to make sure that you put your best foot forward that's applicable in any line of work, but also as we think about scholarship opportunities. And another reason for that good record keeping throughout the years to make sure that you can really pare that down into that four-minute video. Absolutely, absolutely. And there are some of our... um, scholarship applications that are really at the higher end that might even afford an in-person or a video interview, depending on on the situation that we find ourselves in the the moment. And obviously, having those ready-made stories and experiences of what you've learned along the way are a key component of being able to answer those questions as they come up. Because again, as you've been recording and recalling, 
those experiences, those are important for you to be able to pull those out of your bag of memories, you know, and to be able to talk about the skills that you've been learning on the job as well as through the 4-H program as well as in school and how that's going to impact your future career aspirations. And the application deadline is nearing, is that right? Yeah, so we're excited that the scholarship opportunities are open currently right now. The deadline for all recommendation letters and references to be completed is March 1st, 2021. Again, the process is all online, and you can find that through uh, kansas4h.org. If you have any questions, feel free to check with your local extension office, uh, and they'll be able to direct you to those applications. But we are excited this year that it is fully online and uh, opportunity for young people to apply anytime they're available. That's Kansas 4-H state leader Wade Weber with information on applying for Kansas 4-H scholarships. Again, the deadline to complete applications and submit recommendation letters or references is March 1st. To learn more, visit kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.